It was the 41st carrier in the U.S. Navy. A beacon throughout much of the 20th century, throughout wars and disasters. She was a powerful deterrent in a new type of war, a Cold War. This is the USS Midway. Thanks for joining us. I'm Graham Sheldon, and we're aboard one of the longest serving aircraft carriers in U.S. Naval history. Join us as we go behind the scenes of the USS Midway, forever docked in San Diego, California. Well, the USS Midway has a unique history. The USS Midway was commissioned September 10, 1945. A genius of engineering, it represented the pinnacle of military technology. Thousands of men in Newport News, Virginia, uh, worked literally around the clock in a race to get this ship into World War II. President Franklin D. Roosevelt approved construction of a new class of carrier, a ship that would need to withstand new types of enemy strategies and be protected from increasingly more deadly bombs. Uh, imagine building uh, the largest ship in the world uh, from 90 tons of blueprints. Uh, they would then build uh, some dormitories and some other buildings up on the flight deck so workers could literally work around the clock uh, with a new process called arc welding. Built upon the hull design of the Montana-class battleship, a design that was later canceled because of a shift in post-World War II naval strategies, the Midway was the largest ship in the world until the mid-50s. In fact, she was so large, the ship was unable to fit through the Panama Canal. Imagine a ship that's three football fields long, 1,000 feet long, 258 feet wide, about 18 stories from keel to the top of the island, 2,000 rooms, solid steel, and went so fast that you could water ski behind Midway. Uh, at a cost of 90 million, 1945 dollars, uh, they were able to build it in 17 months. Uh, which to me today is just remarkable when you consider the decade or more that it takes to build a modern aircraft carrier. Now, when building an aircraft carrier, do they start at the bottom up? Is that just how it goes? That's how it works. Uh, they start from the bottom up from what they call the keel. Uh, they work their way up uh, as quickly as they could, uh, uh, roughing out, if you will, uh, the hull structure, uh, getting that flight deck down, 196,000 pieces on the flight deck, had to be welded together uh, to fit in a race to get it into the war, missed it by a week. The Midway missed the war, partially because of her complex design, which increased construction time, a design meant to accommodate a new weapon, jet aircraft. CV-41, or the Midway, was given a shakedown in the Caribbean and soon joined the U.S. Atlantic Fleet. You know, imagine a ship that embarked from port for the first time in 1945. It didn't return to port for the final time in 1992. It was a ship that sailed into the cross currents of international crises throughout the entire latter half of the 20th century. You know, Cold Wars came and went, Korea, Vietnam, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the invasion of Kuwait. 225,000 sailors served aboard Midway. Their average age is 19. This is the longest serving carrier of the 20th century. Midway served for 47 years, but like most carriers, only about 10% of its life was spent in active combat. It was primarily served as in deterrence, uh, but however, uh, Vietnam, uh, it served on several deployments. Uh, its aviators shot down the first and last MiGs of the war, and it was also the flagship for Operation Desert Storm, uh, obviously a far shorter engagement uh, in the 1990s. Uh, beyond that, its role primarily was one of sailing at the tip of the sword, out on patrol throughout the length of the Cold War. The Midway is largely as it was since it was decommissioned in, in 92, at least today, as a museum. Fundamentally, it is the same ship that was commissioned in 1945. Certainly there have been some major modifications uh, up on the flight deck, and enlarging the flight deck, doubling the size of the flight deck. Uh, but it, at its very core, the same four engines, same 12 boilers, uh, the same drive shafts and propellers to a large extent, uh, the basic uh, element infrastructure of this ship pretty much has remained unchanged uh, over the course of five decades. 
It's a unique uh, piece of living history that takes us from today's active duty Navy holding events on our flight deck all the way back to uh, the extraordinary bravery and courage of both sailors and pilots uh, in the uncertain days following World War II. When we return, we'll discover what makes an aircraft carrier tick as we see just what life was like on this city at sea. Welcome back to the USS Midway. Having to accommodate 4,500 crewmen made life aboard the ship a cramped affair. It's very public. You have no privacy. A young sailor may be living in a, in a living space that has 60 to 70 other people living with him, sharing showers and that type of thing. And you learn to live that way. Your privacy goes away, there's no doubt of that. It was extremely crowded. Uh, Midway was a floating steel honeycomb with 2,000 rooms on board. Most of them were extremely small. Most of them had one, more than one function. Uh, people shared spaces. No one, almost no one had a private office. You learn the routine. In a 24-hour routine, you know exactly what you do. Most of our young sailors are working 8 to 12 hours a day, every day. Most of us aboard ship know where our workstation is, uh, we know where our bunk is, and we know where we eat. That is the three main things. But it was the hangar deck where activity aboard the Navy's newest aircraft carrier never ceased. We're on the hangar deck, which is by far the largest, it's not even a room, it's by far the largest space on the ship other than the flight deck. Now, what would the hangar deck have been used for? This was a garage. This is where the planes were worked on. The major repairs were taken place, took place. This is where engines were rebuilt uh, and installed and tested out on the fantail before they were installed on planes. Um, and then from here, the planes were taken out on the flight elevators and, and taken up to the flight deck. So down here, there was a, a lot of uh, noise, a lot of banging, uh, smelled of hydraulic fluid and oil and, and grease. It was uh, where the business end of the mechanics took place. The crew working on the mechanics of the ship's huge aircraft contingent would find only intermittent rest in the mess deck. The galleys on Midway were huge. Uh, in, in essence, restaurants. They were open almost 24 hours a day. Uh, the cooks on Midway served 13,500 meals. 10 tons of food was produced every single day. Uh, the numbers are just extraordinary. The bakers had to bake a thousand loaves of bread every single night and it all had to be planned out months ahead so those supplies were available uh, throughout the course of the deployment. Just below the mess deck was sick bay. Wounded sailors could be slid down staircases modified to turn into ramps in the event of emergency. So for 4,500 men, Midway typically had two surgeons, uh, two doctors, uh, about 45 corpsmen, uh, about 20 bunks down there. So you had to be pretty sick or badly injured uh, to stay down there. Typically you would come, if you were not feeling well, see the doctor, get a prescription or whatever it might be and, and be sent back to your bunk. Uh, but it was a fully equipped hospital, two operating rooms, uh, x-ray room, a pharmacy. Uh, if Midway uh, was uh, relatively far out at sea, uh, most serious injuries could be treated, including operations uh, in the middle of the ocean uh, in sickbay. Service on Midway meant long periods away from home. Aboard Midway, there was a post office uh, and there were planes regularly scheduled to deliver the mail uh, and take the mail, but you could easily go two weeks uh, between the time that you sent a letter and your wife or your family or your girlfriend re uh, received it at home. It was a time of slow mail. But like any city, the occasional fight would break out during the quieter moments for the ship's personnel, landing crewmen in the brig. As a city at sea, Midway had a police force. Uh, it was the Marines, 75 Marines uh, that provided police services, security for the nuclear weapons, classified materials, and they ran the jail. Midway had a jail of about six uh, jail cells as part of a criminal justice system aboard this floating city at sea. The captain was the judge. He would typically hold hearings, uh, court sessions, if you will, once a week called captain's mast. And depending upon the uh, personality of the, of the captain, most hearings took about 20 seconds. You'd have the chance to explain yourself, you'd hear what the charges were, and the captain would immediately impose sentence, no appeal. 
Besides being judge and jury, the captain's most iconic role was on the bridge. That was the nerve center uh, of the carrier. Uh, high up forward on the bridge, that's where he spent nearly all of his time at sea. In fact, he had a small cabin right next to the bridge where he slept. Uh, for some captains, uh, it was a blessing, they told me, if they got two or three hours in a row of sleep at night without somebody coming in to apprise him of a situation, ask for orders, clarification, or whatever. So it, the bridge was truly was the nerve center. It's where navigation took place. Uh, there was a 26-year-old at the helm steering this huge ship according to orders. That's where the orders came uh, down to engineering to make a certain uh, uh, speed. From the bridge, the captain could oversee all elements of the ship, including the massive turbines spinning below in engineering. There were four engine rooms on Midway. There were four propellers, uh, 18 tons each. There was an engine room for each of the four propellers, all contributing to a total of 212,000 horsepower uh, in order to propel what became a 75,000 ton aircraft carrier. Midway consumed 100,000 gallons of fuel a day, and its fuel economy, and I use the term loosely, was 260 gallons to the mile. 260 gallons, five boat lengths. Now do the math for 327 days at sea. Coming up next, we'll continue our tour of this famous vessel and meet some of the planes that made her an awesome weapon of war. Welcome back to the USS Midway Museum. The museum attracts thousands of visitors every month, making it a fixture on the west coast of the United States. And the flight deck is a favorite area for guests. This is where uh, all the action takes place. This is where 4,500 men focus their time and attention so that flight ops can take place here on a four acre flight deck. And the man in charge of organizing the chaos in the flight deck was the air boss. Vern Jumper served as air boss aboard the Midway. I was the assistant air boss and the air boss from 1973 to 75. The official name of the air boss is the air officer. I'm a department head on the ship and I'm in charge of the launch and recovery of all the air wing aircraft. The air boss is also responsible for aircraft movement, both on the hangar and flight deck. This includes catapult operations, refueling, and taking off. When you're a pilot taking off on Midway, you're launching over the course of only 75 yards, one good NFL punt, if you will. Most of the aircraft I flew off carriers were prop jobs, so we deck launched. Uh, we did get cat shots occasionally. A cat shot refers to the catapult, a steam-powered device designed to launch a plane from the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. We taxi the aircraft uh, from this position up forward to the catapults where they are strapped onto the catapult. Our steam catapults are capable of launching a 70,000 pound airplane off the end of the ship, go from zero to 150 to 60 miles an hour in two and a half seconds. Why you really don't have much choice after that. Uh, you're kind of a passenger for the first few seconds. If the pressure level of the catapult is not set correctly, a launch from the flight deck might become a trip to the ocean very quickly. There's always an element of danger on the flight deck. Uh, an aircraft carrier flight deck is one of the most dangerous places in the world to work. It's been stated that working on a flight deck is probably one of the most dangerous places in the world to work. It's not still like we are. Normally Midway's doing this, rocking and rolling a little bit. You've got a 30 knot wind coming down the deck. That's the environment that the young men work on, on Midway. So it's a little deceptive right now, isn't it? I mean, it's a sunny day. Oh, sure. It's, it's beautiful, calm breeze, and that's, that's not what they're landing in. No, 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 and we're tied up to the pier. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not all the case. We've got 15 to 30 aircraft turning up on the flight deck. Uh, you have to be aware of where you are at all times. This was a dangerous environment, even on the calmest of days in some respects. It could be a problem with an aircraft. There could be a, a problem with the equipment on the flight deck. They have to know where the intakes are because you can be sucked up into the intake of a jet engine. Well, simply walking around the flight deck could be hazardous. Actually landing a plane was another story. Sometimes it's a little easier than others. Uh, you got a nice steady deck, it uh, can be a lot of fun. Uh, you get a pitching deck at night, why it's not so much fun. I headed out toward uh, Taipei. Uh, I got a sump warning light. That's a warning light on my instrument panel that indicated that there might be something wrong with my engine. 
So I had to declare an emergency and head back to the ship to land in this rain squall. They brought me in on the radar and set me up on a rate of descent. And Ace was talking to me, and he kept checking with me every now and then. Uh, a few seconds later, Tommy, you got the ship? I said, no, I don't see the ship, but I see the glow from the lens. And he said, don't worry, the ship is right underneath it. And I got close to the ramp. He said, I got you. He gave me a couple of quick lineup calls, gave me a verbal cut. I chopped the power and landed the aircraft. Many of the planes flown off the Midway by pilots such as Tom Tompkins were restored by the museum and remain there to this day. Two of the aircraft that uh, most visitors instantly recognize are our F-14 Tomcat and right next door an F-A-18 Hornet. Uh, they are of top gun fame. The F-14 Tomcat was an uh, immensely powerful, highly advanced aircraft that uh, our aviators flew uh, for, for several decades. Uh, the one that we have on board is very typical uh, of what was uh, what you saw in Operation Desert Storm and on other missions. Our Hornet right next door is an unusual Hornet. Uh, when you take a look at that, you'll see it's painted in a camouflage color. Well, actually, what you want to look at a little more closely is the portion that's not painted in camouflage, but the gray portion. It's painted to essentially reflect the silhouette of a Russian MiG an enemy aircraft. There are red stars still on the tail because that specific Hornet's last role before it was retired was to fly as a bad guy at the Top Gun School. While the F-16 and F-18 saw action in combat and on high-profile training runs, the real workhorse of naval aviation was the CH-46 helicopter. CH-46, Sea Knight, uh, was one that was typical. Uh, it had the ability to carry primarily crew uh, as well as cargo. It was made famous in some respects through Operation Frequent Wind, uh, rescuing uh, hundreds of people uh, over the course of, of just one day. Uh, helicopters are uh, an important and perhaps underappreciated element of naval aviation. They make movies about Top Gun, not so much the helicopters, but they're very important to us here aboard the USS Midway. Coming up after the break, we'll find out how the Midway went from floating fortress to one of the most famous naval museums in the world. Welcome back to the USS Midway. Jet aircraft technology was still in its infancy when the ship was first commissioned, and the Sky Warrior carried the military's most formidable weapon. Originally designed uh, as a nuclear bomber. The Sky Warrior holds a special distinction in naval aviation. It was the largest plane uh, designed to operate off aircraft carriers. The Sky Warrior on Midway weighed 70,000 pounds. The Sky Warrior's size and range made it an impressive strategic bomber, capable of striking a wide variety of targets, including into the Soviet Union. With the dawn of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States began building up a vast nuclear arsenal. The USS Midway carried nuclear weapons which were heavily guarded below decks. Midway was the first American carrier to carry nuclear weapons. Eight of this country's first nuclear weapons were aboard Midway, about three decks, four decks down from where we're standing right here uh, in, by the late 1940s. So uh, the very far-sighted uh, planners of the Pentagon during World War II were anticipating some of these things that far in advance. Not all the aircraft on the flight deck of the museum are jet-powered, however. One of my favorite aircraft on Midway is the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber on the hangar deck. Uh, that was the aircraft that won the Battle of Midway, the famous Torpedo Squadron 8 uh, that lost nearly every aviator uh, in leading the charge of the ambush against the Japanese fleet. This type of aircraft literally changed the war in about 10 seconds uh, when uh, its pilots uh, destroyed so much of the Japanese fleet that was sailing toward Midway Island. Uh, in 1942. It's a very special plane. It's one that uh, uh, World War II aviators uh, look on very fondly. Uh, we have several SBD pilots uh, from World War II who love to share stories about their experiences in this aircraft uh, with our museum visitors. Overlooking the planes on the flight deck was a structure called the island, containing the vital command centers of the ship. Obviously, a lot of planning takes place uh, out at sea by senior officers when uh, different situations come up, either foreseen or unexpected. 
TFCC, Tactical Flag Command Center, often called the War Room, or CIC. That, that's where the Admiral or the Captain would have his staff. That's where the uh, radar was. Uh, so they would be able to monitor what was going on, both in terms of inbound and outbound midway aircraft, as well as the aircraft and ships of others. Snap decisions sometimes had to be made in, in times of emergency or crisis, whether it be combat or humanitarian. Uh, it was an area that was classified. Uh, access was restricted, uh, but it was one that was crucial to the effectiveness of the aircraft carrier. The decisions made in the war room could be easily relayed in the radio room close by. Communication is vital, uh, and, and in Midway's day, it was all done by radio. Uh, dozens and dozens of radio frequencies. Uh, there were times during the Cold War that they were changing the frequency by plan of all those radios every 15 to 30 minutes so that the Russians could not uh, monitor uh, and, and, and take those messages, messages, if you will. So it was an area of immense responsibility because if a message wasn't, was sent but not received, then it was a message that wasn't sent. There were uh, dozens of radio men on Midway who, who performed a, a vital and were a critical link uh, in Midway's ability to do the job. They were the ones who sent the messages and made sure the messages got to their destinations aboard Midway. Near the USS Midway Museum in San Diego is the largest naval base in the United States with the ability to dock several aircraft carriers. A constant reminder of the role carriers play in the Navy today is CV-76, the USS Ronald Reagan, docked just across the water from the Midway. For those of us wishing to experience modern naval aviation without the element of danger, there are the Midway Museum's advanced flight simulators. We have three different types of flight simulators. Uh, one is a more of a fixed simulator. We are flying against the computer. There is another one that is on hydraulics where a group of guests uh, have the opportunity to experience a, a mission off Midway in Operation Desert Storm. Perhaps our most popular is the Strike Fighter 360, the uh, individual cockpits where you engage in air-to-air -air combat where you completely control the action. You can do the spins, the rolls, the loop-to-loops, whatever it takes, depending upon your adventure quotient. It's a lot of fun for everybody. Visitors of all ages continue to flock to the USS Midway Museum, docked in San Diego, California, as the next chapter in the history of this aircraft carrier continues to be written. This ship has become an icon in the United States. Uh, frequently have guests come aboard who have come to San Diego just to come aboard the Midway. It's the gold standard of aircraft carrier museums. We want to become a living symbol of freedom on the West Coast. This museum the legacy of those men who served aboard this ship, and by extension all those who serve, is an opportunity to uh, be preserved, uh, to help inspire future generations, to educate and even entertain uh, future generations, to, to keep that legacy alive. There's a camaraderie generated not only on an aircraft carrier, but throughout the U.S. Navy and any military organization. You become closer to your workmates than anywhere else in the world. Thanks for joining us on our tour of the USS Midway. We'll see you next time.